Okay, um, let's start. So, hi everyone, I'm Moriano and I'll be the moderator for this panel. And first of all, thank you all for coming to this panel, uh, Women in Blockchain panel. Uh, happy International Women's Day to everybody. Uh, so, this Women in Blockchain panel is a subcommittee of BAS. And uh, in line with International Women's Day, we decided to bring together this panel with, of, of course, our stellar lineup of panelists. And um, the theme is leading females in fintech and blockchain, shaping a more equal future. So um, we brought together, we're very honored to have brought together this panel of panelists for them to share their thoughts and their experiences in this industry. Uh, so before we start, let me introduce to you our panelists for today. Hang on, uh, let me share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, so um, Hang on, I think, sorry, yeah, there's a... Okay, can see? Okay, yeah, so um, this panel is Women in Blockchain, International Women's Day 2021. So basically what we'll be talking about, it will be uh, how women own and driven innovative tech are helping to navigate through this COVID-19 world and, you know, just all the experiences that can be shared. So our first, hmm, oh, first up we have Megan Lee. She is a uh, co-founder of Rectang Technology that was founded in 2020. And uh, Rectang is a compliance solution that provides a risk-based approach compliance, eh, sorry, combining both KYC and KYT functions to provide a 360, 360 degree risk profile. Um, she entered the blockchain industry in 2017 and has also more than five years of experience in the tech field and has led the company to raise a seed fund of 2 million SGD and is on a fast track to its growth. Next up, we have Catherine. Uh, Catherine is head of APEC marketing for TZ APEC, a blockchain consultancy pioneering enterprise adoption use of use cases of in Asia. She was previously global marketing head for Liquid.com, uh, the world's first global cryptocurrency platform regulated in Japan, and she currently sits on the board of Singapore Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Industry Association which advocates for financial inclusion through blockchain, blockchain technology. Next, we have Grace Chong. Um, Grace heads the regulatory in, and fintech team at Simmons & Simmons, JWS, which advises exchanges, custody companies, and startups across Singapore and Hong Kong on regulatory issues such as banking and payment regulations, implementation of electronic trading platforms, crypto fund management, etc. Um, she's also she was also former in-house counsel at MAS and um, is a board member of Access Singapore, Women in Payments, and IAPP Women Leading Privacy. Last but not least, we have uh, Pooja Singha. Um, she's an associate director at a Singapore law firm, Fort Law LC, LLC, where she practices as a registered registered foreign lawyer. Uh, she advises blockchain-enabled companies on a range of matters from traditional financing, tokenized fund formations, ICOs, STOs, etc. Um, she's also experienced in financial service compliance and privacy compliance and frequently speaks on panels covering both traditional and new age topics. So um, before we start, let's look at some statistics for about women in fintech. So if you all can see from the light green side, uh, from 2010 all the way to 2019, there actually has been an increase in women-founded uh, companies. From 10, com 10, number of start 
startups in 2010 to 95 startups in 2019. So that's quite a significant growth in nine years. Uh, looking at Southeast Asia, the number of women in tech in Southeast Asia has beat the global average of 32% of the sector, the workforce, compared to 20% on average around the globe. And in Singapore, uh, in Southeast Asia itself, so Thailand top, tops the charts in Southeast Asia with 42%. And back home in Singapore, we have 41% of women who are actually working in the tech sector. Uh, yeah. So the last slide is actually just to show that locally in Singapore that we are actually a very hot bit for fintech innovation and we are actually number two, the second city that is ranked for having a positive environment for women in general in the AFAC region. So these are just some small statistics and resources that uh, we, hang on. Uh, yeah, so, I think it will be more, let's, let's delve into the personal experiences, which I think all of you will be more interested in. Uh, let's hear from our panelists now. Uh, let's start with Megan. Um, yeah, so Megan is founder of, co-founder of Rectang. Uh, so how do you develop an interest in blockchain technology? Yeah, hi, uh, good evening everyone. I'm Megan. So just as just introduced, I'm the co-founder of Red Tank. So actually the first time I know about blockchain, it was in 2017. So one of my friends, he told me the, the blockchain. So I heard about this uh, concept is about, you know, the decentralization, the distributed ledger. It sounds very interesting, right? So I, I Google to learn what is blockchain. And then I, I, I read about the white paper of Big, Bitcoin. Actually, that, that I was quite shocked by the, the, the design of the, uh, the, the idea, the point-to-point -point payment system. I feel it's so genius. So I, I look into further about this uh, technology. And very interesting to give you a big background. I, I, was in the, I was a business student. And after that, I started my company. And uh, the first company we started was uh, in 2016. Yeah, we developed a travel mobile app. But at that time, I didn't touch the technology too much because I had my CTO, I had my tech team. So but this time about the blockchain, it's really something that I'm very interested. So I look into the technologies, the applications of uh, uh, blockchain. But to be very honest, what really made me interested is not the te technology itself. Yeah, because as the business background, it's always about the opportunities and uh, the new industry that coming along with the uh, with the technology. So I feel even at that time, the it's really something new to the market because in 2017, right, we have uh, so many people they coming from overseas to Singapore to set up their uh, blockchain projects to issue their tokens at that time. So we get to uh, talk to a lot of people. We get to talk about the, the market, the technology, the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrencies. So in 2018, my partner and me, we decided to redirect our business to blockchain. So in the beginning, we just uh, did something quite simple, which is the advisory service to the overseas companies. And uh, then it was, the time when my personal interests becoming my business and my daily work. So uh, we have been participating in quite a lot of uh, blockchain projects in the way of like investment or like providing the advisory service. So, and also I'm uh, personally, I'm quite interested in the tradings and the investment in the secondary market for the cryptocurrency. So actually this, uh, I have been trading since one, 2017. And uh, it has been around four years. Actually, it's very helpful experience and I'm forcing myself to do trading because it helped me to let me keep in the market. So every day I have to look into the market to know what is happening and what is the new concept, what is the new 
uh, uh, ideas and what are the new organizations that coming into the blockchain, the cryptocurrencies. So it really helps me with my work, the Red Hand project. And uh, I also feel that uh, the beauty of uh, blockchain industry is that uh, there's, there's always new things happen. And it's, it's happened so fast. You know, every, only every a few months, there's new ideas coming out. There's new projects coming out, right? It's, it's super fast. It's, it's faster than uh, any of the industries that happens ever before. So this is very, very, very interesting. And uh, uh, that's also, we find it's, a very, it's very good for the business people because as long as you keep exploring, you will find your opportunities to do something that you can achieve, right? That's how we uh, start the Red Tech uh, project. And we, we started this project. Actually, it's a quite new project. We start last year, uh, 2020. So, uh, we, because at the time we help some of our clients to uh, do their, it's like because we see that uh, there are the new regulations coming out to the cryptocurrencies. In Singapore is the PSA and uh, they have the, the regulations to the digital payment service providers. So we help some of our clients with uh, the application of the license, right? It's very basic things. But we realized the regulations is something uh, quite new for the cryptos but it's really in the very big demand, right? Not only the regulators, also the big uh, and traditional financial organizations, let's say DBS is coming in, Standard Charter is coming in. So the regulations is more uh, needed and it's something necessary, not like a few years ago, people are trying to avoid regulations. People, people don't like to be regulated in the crypto uh, world, right? So we realized it's something new and something uh, quite in the early stage in the market. So that's why we started this uh, company, the Red Tank, to provide the compliance solutions to the uh, crypto companies. And uh, uh, it, it really, it goes really well. Yeah, and we see the market needs and uh, we are quite confident to, to get things better uh, in the industry. Yeah, so that's basically, my interest in the blockchain is more in the market. And uh, mm. I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's quite good. And I believe as long as you have the interest in the, in the market, right, you will get your opportunities. Uh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your in how do you develop your interest, Megan. Um, next, maybe we'd like to hear from Catherine. Um, what do you think women in the industry have achieved and what would they like to achieve in the future in this industry? Yeah, thanks, Ariana. So uh, I think I can't speak for all women, but um, at, least, uh, at least a subset of them who are in tech. Um, I, I, th I feel that um, within blockchain specifically, there are as you mentioned in your slides, an uptick of women who are becoming female founders. Um, you know, you have Megan here um, and also women who are in roles in the blockchain space as well at C-level positions, senior management level positions like Kuja and Grace as well. So um, we also have female representation in industry associations like BAS and XS and um, other fintech associations. Uh, so we are seeing this uh, gender, uh, this this um, gender ratio slowly equalizing, slowly <laughs> but surely. But it's a long way to go, a long way to go. Um, I feel that women have a different narrative now compared to when I was growing up. Uh, so during my time, I remember I was raised on Disney movies where the princess as her happy <laughs> after in the form of a prince charming and they ride yeah. off into the sunset and that's the happy ending right yeah. but uh nowadays you have you know princess moana and mulan and and uh, all sorts of narratives that, like frozen where you have a princess who doesn't really need the prince and so she rules her own kingdom and mm. she can do her own thing so there's there's that narrative that hollywood is scripting and 
eventually, you know, it, it permeates, right, in our social fabric. Women are becoming more empowered, and at some point, it's not about identifying yourself with, by your gender. Rather, you know, it's like how Lady Gaga says that, like, um, I'm not a female artist, I'm just an artist. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's within our space, it's also moving towards the direction. Um, and uh, with more, pr more, um, programs like women girls who code or women in blockchain like i hope to see yeah more representation from our part and to see more um yeah women panels as opposed to manals you know <laughs> girl panels yeah and also like don't forget women give birth to the creators of this of this movement so you know vitalik's mom gave birth to like one of the greatest inventors in our space <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the unicorn t-shirts and complete as a genius <laughs> yeah, yeah um, <laughs> one of the guys David Sean said that we need more women in leadership roles across the board I think that's my boss definitely yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 that's that's great yeah very true the gender is getting more yeah, like cool and, now, yeah, and Singapore's friendly um, yeah. when it comes to um, yeah gender diversity. So um, yeah, we're not lopsided or anything. We're quite equal. Yeah. and I'm also mm. making it a point to hire more females as well um, within my team. Yeah, mm. so that's yeah. I know it's it's biased, but this bias is supported in my company culture. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, yeah use it to my fullest advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's not biased. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so next up we have Grace. Uh yeah, so Grace, what was the some of the ch biggest challenges you face, you know, in this industry? Yeah, so hearing from Catherine, um, who who also, you know, we, we were part of the same board and, and some of the things she said are really, you know, echoed in my experience as well. And um, indeed, what I find is that now we have a lot more equal female uh, representation in this space. I call it digital equity. And, you know, um, I think quite a lot of, um, you know, thought to how we achieve that delicate balance on promoting female representation, but at the same time, ensuring that we have our male allies in this space. So um, definitely when I first started out um, actually in Hong Kong, um, in the blockchain space, um, I remember my first um, blockchain event in Cyberport um, about five, six years ago, um, there were 30 men there. I was the only woman in Cyberport. And it was oh. quite interesting because, you know, I met um, a lot of my good friends today, you know, Anthony, um, you know, Artri, and now into Masik and all that. And, and, and a lot of the faces that I still see in this space. And at that time, um, um, you know, picking up on a lot of the tech then and learning from the people around. I think one of my first few mentors in this space was actually um, a male mentor um, who was actually one of my clients and the head of uh, an exchange called FXCH. And he was the first one who taught me about delegated proof of stakes, um, DAO. Um, he flew down to Shanghai to join me for a conference just because he said, you know, Grace, I'll join you on the panel. And because of all the work you have been doing for us, we, are really, we really appreciate it. So he flew 24 hours to Shanghai just to join me. And, you know, we had lunch and he flew 24 hours back. And, you know, um, really support like that um, in the industry, both from male allies as well as um, a lot of people in the space are always very important and very much welcome. And I, I think that um, in this space, we really have to promote especially um, other females and academic um, research in this space. So for example, um, you know, one of the amazing women that I've met um, in this space in Singapore, uh, Lisa Tan, um, uh, who wrote the whole book on DeFi that I recently read um, for, um, you know, one of the projects I did, um, you know, I read it in one entire night and it was brilliant, really uh, well written in a very simple way to encapsulate uh, DeFi. And we really have to push, you know, academic research and uh, people who are founders and support more women in this space because ultimately in venture cap, um, as you know, the figures, women only receive 2.7% of venture cap uh, funding. So um, even in the legal space, um, I, I don't know how many lawyers are part in of this group today, but um, you know, 52% of solicitors are women, but only 19% actually end up making partnership. And right now in my firm, I'm actually the only female um, 
only senior female in our firm uh, of um, around seven male partners. So, you know, it's a, it's quite fun, fun, fun space around. So um, definitely um, you, um, you really have to think about how, um, you know, women are at the crossroads of tech and the investment of society. And definitely there are a lot of women in fintech, but we are not always visible and our voice is not always heard. And I think the way we support each other and the way we network and really promote each other in the community really has um, a strong reason on how we can do things better in this community. Yeah. yeah. I actually wanted to add uh, to Grace's point about male allies. Um, I totally agree with that. The most important thing that can really empower, two very important things that can help empower a girl, uh, supportive parents, and then supportive bosses <laughs> which starts working yeah so just want to affirm that yep okay sounds great okay um last but not least we have puja uh let's hear from puja um yeah so puja how do you keep your skills relevant for this technology industry Sure. Thanks, uh, Rihanna, and hello, everybody. Mm. Um, so how do I keep my skills relevant? Um, just, to, just to set the stage first. So, uh, you know, my perspective is obviously that of a legal advisor in this space. I'm an international lawyer who's been advising in this space, and I'm now uh, attached to a Singapore law firm. Now, just going back to the basics, I think what you really need to be an effective advisor in the technology space is a rather unique mix of technical skills and soft skills. Um, and I'd like to share a little bit about my own journey into becoming advisor in this space uh, in the hope that it will be helpful to other advisors on the call, uh, on this uh, webinar, particularly those who might be sort of at the start of their careers. Um, now, this is a journey that I began, I think, similar to most of you about five, six years ago. I think if you ask 2015 or maybe even 2016 me that I'd be speaking on a panel uh, on which has blockchain experts, I think I would laugh because you know I didn't even know as most of us did that that word even existed, and I was back then plugging away uh, in a in a large department in a large law firm, churning away at you know bank finance and debt restructuring and you know other such um, plain vanilla transactions. So it's been quite uh, a pivot for me from the traditional finance to the new age advisory, as I now call it. Uh, in all honesty, it has been a challenging journey. Uh, that's because, as I said, I think there's some unique skills that you need to be an effective advisor. I'm by no means already there. I'm still kind of working my way uh, to being there. Um, but some of the challenges that I've faced, I think, are actually gender specific. It's not actually discrimination per se. I would agree with most of you that in Singapore, we don't have uh, that that sort of uh, conceptual uh, gender issue, uh, not to say that it doesn't exist, but I think it's not sort of as egregious or um, you know in your face. Uh, I think for me the gender issue has been more about just getting out of my own head. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's the classic female stereotypes of uh, you know being scared to go outside your comfort zone, being scared to operate in the gray, and indeed being an advisor in the technology space is very much doing exactly those things, whether you like it or not. Um, so again, just to go into the specifics, you know, what is actually you know, challenging about the area? I think one is just clearly uh, embracing the unknown. Um, you know, if, um, as, as Megan said, now you have companies that actually want to be regulated, but where, do you, where should one get regulated is sort of uh, uh, another big can of worm in itself. Now, even if you were a graduate from a Singapore law school a few years ago, you wouldn't know about the Payment Services Act simply because it didn't even exist in the books uh, at that time. Um, even the Cayman uh, Virtual Asset Service Providers Law is as recent as six months uh, old. So, uh, you know, it's really a very steep learning curve uh, to understand what's actually new and current in the space. And I think most of us didn't really learn technology law as a discipline in our schools. Uh, or in our universities, or even if we did, that knowledge is by now, you know, well out of date. So there's a definite challenge in there in terms of uh, staying on top of one games. Um, now, even if you did know the law, I think 
uh, there's sort of the other soft skills you need to develop around that. So I think particularly in the technology space more so than in others, you need to have what I like to call the smell test. Um, you know, a regulator will throw a thousand page rule book at you, but what are the two, three things that it really cares about are something that you only gather with experience by talking to people and just sort of, you know, going, getting yourself there. Um, so for example, what's the latest legal tool that the SEC is going to use to come after any startup targeting the US is, is anyone's guess. But again, you just have to sort of, you know, stay on top of the shifting regulatory trends to know uh, and develop that, uh, that smell test. So what does that mean as an advisor? So I think going back to what I said earlier, you have to really be comfortable operating outside your comfort zone. So in practical terms, it means that you have to be able and willing to learn and keep learning pretty much throughout your career. Uh, how have I done that uh, practically? I, I do feel we're quite privileged in Singapore to access a whole wide range of learning. Uh, in the last few years, I've um, you know, not been shy to go back to the drawing board. I've done courses on privacy compliance, uh, financial services compliance. I also very much recommend the Harvard CS50 course uh, on computer science for lawyers, just some things to get the theoretical base uh, uh, in there. Uh, but of course, there's no learning ground like the practical. And in fact, the best way to learn is uh, from your own clients. Um, and I think this is where gender roles do become a little bit more important. You know, you have to be okay with telling your client, I don't understand what you just said to me. Can you break it down for me in layman's terms? Because that is the only way that I can effectively advise you. And it's happened all too often that, you know, somebody will tell you with, you know, all confidence and all bravado that they have a fully, uh, you know, risk-free business model and they have zero regulatory risk because they've got an opinion from X jurisdiction or Y jurisdiction. And then when you start to sort of, you know, peel back the layers of the onion, you realize that actually your first instinct was right. And if it indeed smelt like a fish, then it probably was a fish. So you just have to be confident enough to kind of keep drilling down to make sure you push your clients to explain to you to make sure that you understand, even if it might seem, you know, very, a very dark and scary place to operate in. Um, also, where I've seen it play out and, and including in my own case is that uh, I think more so than in other practice areas, it's not so much about theoretical knowledge, but it's also about practical application. So for example, you know, you might know how AML and KYC and privacy compliance works from a theoretical perspective, but how it works in a decentralized system such as blockchain is yet to be fully settled. So you have to find bespoke solutions for your clients and you often end up finding a solution that uh, isn't 100%, but it still takes away say 70 to 80% of the risk. So again, you have to be comfortable with embracing the gray and with having clients that are comfortable in operating in the gray. Because again, I think a lot of traditional advisors, including myself, that's not how uh, we were originally trained. You know, it was all about taking all risk off the table, but that's just not the landscape that uh, technology uh, companies operate in for the most part. I think it's also um, important to keep, um, uh, sorry, just to finish off, so, so when I was talking about the practical aspects, you know, you have to again push your clients, how is, how does your platform work in practice, how exactly does KYC work, what is the user interface that a customer sees, those are the sort of specifics that you need to drill down to and, you know, clients will try and brush you off because they don't want to get into specifics, they don't think a lawyer needs to understand, they, everybody's doing something particular way, so, you know, why are you make, making such a fuss about this, so again, it's about having that confidence and it's about uh, sticking your ground and really not being scared to learn from your clients. Um, and uh, as a final point, I have to, I, I, what I will say is that it's you know being relevant uh, in this space is again about uh, challenging yourself, forcing yourself to challenge yourself. Uh, one of the reasons I started on this uh, panel circuit, uh, I think back in 2018, is simply because it forced me to keep up to speed with you know things changing at the speed of light. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, as high pressure as a you know live public event to kind of force you to go back and read you know what the latest developments have been otherwise you know it just it's just something that's kind of background noise that you just learn to sort of ignore uh, I have to also confess that I was a little bit tired of attending many 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 manuals in the space a few years ago and um, realizing from listening to the content that actually you knew way more than you thought you did and so you should really have the confidence uh, to put yourself um, out there 
uh, and I think that, you know, Catherine, I think talked talked about uh, manners as well. Uh, so I think, you know, to round up, I think, um, you know, I think the space has some unique challenges, uh, but therefore it's also upon us. And I think particularly as women in the space to challenge ourselves even more uh, to be effective and successful advisors. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you for it's very insightful and very, very, very interesting. I was like, wow. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we have some questions from the audience. Uh, this one is for Pooja. Sharon would like to know what is the Ministry of Law's views on smart contracts replacing property conveyancing services but legal firms? Right, so I think just, um, I, I saw that question earlier mm. and I think I... Uh, little cheekily posted uh, an article I wrote in response. Uh, I think just taking a step back, I mean, Singapore, uh, being Singapore is obviously way ahead of the curve uh, in many respects in terms of all things digitization, all things innovation, uh, including in the legal services space. Uh, as we know, the Future Law Innovation Program has been around for a long time, and it's all about uh, actually lawyers using digitization as a tool and understanding that uh, one should embrace digitization to leverage it rather than fear being replaced by it. So I think, um, you know, I think Minlaw has uh, very much uh, a very nuanced understanding of that. It's also been kind of pushing out many programs to in empower um, the smaller law firms in particular to kind of equip themselves with the challenges of the digital age. And I think that's, that's kind of, um, again, a uniquely Singapore example where the government is kind of uh, you know, seeing the potential of the technology and actually, you know, bringing it down um, for use by a particular industry so that it's kind of demystified. So I think that's just kind of a macro point um, I, I'll, I'll make on, you know, Singapore legal services and, and blockchain specifically as well. Uh, I think as far as, uh, you know, the use in real estate is concerned, I think um, certainly uh, it's, 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 it's very much, um, uh, uh, a possibility. I think, you know, the whole kind of concept of smart contracts, of course, is kind of taking away some of the operational aspects of a contract. So to the extent that that brings about process efficiency, uh, particularly for volume based transactions, I think real estate transactions would be kind of a perfect um, testing ground for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think one must uh, be a little bit cautious about smart contracts, kind of replacing legal contracts in its entirety. I think um, there's just sometimes uh, a bit of a gap in terms of, um, you know, there's certain parts of legal contracts that obviously just can't be replaced. They can still be digitized, but they can't be sort of, you know, uh, automated. Um, and I think what's going to be interesting is to see uh, how the kind of non-smart contract bits of a contract can actually be more digitized uh, going forward, because that's where a lot of the process inefficiencies uh, still remain, where there's a lot of sort of human cost of lawyers' time as well. And frankly, I don't, well, I think it might drive some lawyers out of business or it might force them to adapt. But I think, um, again, this is uh, a classic example of how, you know, this is a kind of work where if you kind of hand over to machines or a more efficient process, then you can actually kind of move up the value curve and do something that's more uh, qualitative. So I think that's uh, definitely something that can be uh, looked into. Um, Grace, I don't know if you perhaps have, uh, you know, more specific uh, feedback in terms of, uh, you know, the min law approach. Yeah, um, I would say not specific to uh, real estate specifically, but I think there is some work by um, different firms to actually um, look at, you know, legal tech and, um, you know, different ways of actually um, implementing solutions for projects. So some of the ways which, um, you know, we have actually been looking at this is, for example, Simmons bought over a legal engineering firm called Wavelang. And um, most recently for um, Ibor or uh, remediation projects, which is, you know, you have thousands and thousands of agreements and, you know, you're, you're looking at um, efficient ways of doing it and, and how you are actually recording this in future and, you know, whether there are more uh, reasonable ways of, um, you know, 
putting out su such contracts. And some of these uh, involve legal technology. Some of the new trade finance projects that we have done, like uh, Project Contour, uh, which had to do with R3 um, and, and some of the eight banks um, in the industry uh, for trade finance specific issues, also looked at uh, blockchain specific issues. And there are very interesting aspects on how you build a rule book when you have different types of parties in the industry, because you are looking at um, basically how you achieve consensus between the different parties, how you ensure that AML and KYC is done by different parties in the chain, how do you pass information and ensure data privacy and record information amongst that. And, um, you know, very interesting IP issues because um, Project uh, Contour was originally called Project Voltron at its, <laughs> at its in, uh, initial um, upfront. So if you want to know why it was changed, you can Google Voltron and you will, you know, find some interesting background there as well. So um, one of the um, interesting uh, projects which I was also in involved in was actually um, a project to actually um, a build a whole um, to, to form a co whole consortium to build a first cross industry large scale digital platform to enable many businesses to collaborate using the IBM blockchain platform and blockchain based uh, smart legal contracts. So um, you know we were not looking specifically at solidity because I see that co that question from um, Sharon over there, um, but basically we were looking at how companies could actually join this network to use. Um, digitize contracts, exchange data, and confirm the authenticity and status of legal contracts. And you know, once completed, how do organizations manage the whole life cycle of the contract, not just from negotiation to signing, but also continuing over the term of the agreement with transparency and permission-based access across uh, different parties in the network. And um, you know, that there are very interesting issues there. And now as we move on, and Catherine is very familiar with such aspects because Catherine and I, we do a lot of crypto work. And as you start moving on questions like digital assets and use of digital custodians, um, you start considering um, very interesting issues on you know, the use of data, transfer of information, sharing of keys, um, um, and, and a lot of the expectations of the regulators with respect to security, uh, data management, um, and, and you know, basically capital, capital when it comes to your, um, you know, the, the assets which are backing up some of the tokens on the blockchain. So I think it's, it's a very interesting space and I would echo that it's definitely one where you see law, tech and many other, um, you know, specialisms all merging in one. And this is also why I find it uh, fascinating in this space and there's a lot of expertise in this area really merging, yeah. I actually just wanted to add to the cost of capital and that's the cost of human capital. So, you know, whilst I never uh, got called to the bar, I did put myself through law school, but um, I can imagine if I were an article clerk uh, coming in to, you know, to actually practice, uh, learn to practice. Um, I, and, you know, blockchain was coming online in legal tech, uh, especially within the smart contract, like conveying applications in, in conveyancing, for example. I, I would be saving so much time <laughs> because um, basically a lot of the grant work gets allocated to junior lawyers right, or clerks. And uh, now if we get to free up the time of our future generations of lawyers to do more meaningful or like more complex case law, deal with more complex case law and deal with more uh, sophisticated cases, I think we would definitely have uh, um, a more well-trained, more sophisticated um, batch of lawyers who will be very well versed with tech law and legal tech. Um, and I'm actually really looking forward to that future because no long gone are the days where you suit up just to like photocopy reams and reams of like contracts, you know, everything's digitized, everything's like self-executing, at, at least for the, the contracts that can be standardized anyway. Okay, that was great. Yes, yeah, Megan, would you like to? Yeah, actually, uh, there's a okay because uh, I think they already you already shared quite much about the this legal part because I saw there's another uh, question raised by Sharon about the uh, sustainability of the blockchain technologies, right? For that one, especially he, she mentioned that uh, as it does uh, generate heat and add on to carbon emission at a rapid rate. So actually for this question, I have something, uh, some interesting idea to, to share. So when we are talking about uh, using the natural resources to, to do something, to generate something. 
So we need to think about what is the thing that generates by consuming the resources, right? So let's say, I, I guess when you're talking about the, the add-on to the carbon emissions, basically it's about the mining, right? The, the Bitcoin mining take a lot of the electricity to do the mining. But uh, the thing is whether you believe in the, the value of Bitcoin. So <laughs> it's, something, it's something more about the, the, the cryptocurrency, but really Bitcoin is uh, or the other cryptocurrencies, right? It's some, some kind of, it's kind of value. It's, a, it's a, a form of the value, which is similar as the concept of money, the fair currencies. So actually this is not my idea. This is a, a, from a talk between uh, Michael Saylor and uh, Ross Stevens. Michael is the, you know, he's the CEO of uh, Michael, MicroStrategy. So uh, I can share the link of that talk, which I highly recommend you to, to watch the talk between them. So it's really something, some new ideas about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. So here I put the, the, I put the link you can feel free to, to watch that video, the full video. I think you are mute, you mute yourself. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's the link. Thank you, Megan, for sharing. Um, I think we have another question from Ida. Yeah, there are a lot of... Uh, Ideas for new project names. <laughs> <laughs> Darth Vader. <laughs> I think project Star Wars, yeah. <laughs> I would like that. Um, okay, I think there's one question from Ida. She, she said that she's one of the few women in heavily involved in blockchain space in Australia and Asia, and the use case in the fintech industry. So one of the major groups that she keeps hearing from women is that the language permitting in this space is too techy, geeky, and nerdish, and it's purposefully done so. So how does the panel, as women leaders in blockchain, aim to practically bridge this, demystify the language in order to bring more women on board? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with that because, you know, being a lawyer, we are often blamed for this uh, more, more so than other and US lawyers even more so because it's impossible to read a US contract if you have ever tried. Um, um, I, I recall one of the lines that um, this lady called Shannon Alder once said, which is that the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't being said and the art of reading between the lines is a lifelong quest of the wise. And I would say that uh, my experience is it's sometimes, you know, that the tech language ju just sometimes tends to subterfuge, you know, the, the meaning behind that. And especially in crypto, that's quite important. And we, we do a lot of opinions. I think we have done the most, um, you know, I was just remarking to my team, we have done most 150 to 200 opinions to date. And sometimes the DeFi opinions, you have to read between the lines of exactly what their token really sets out to do. Um, but it's very important you learn the tag. Um, um, sadly, I do have to, you know, um, say that because in order for you to break down and understand and to see whether there is substance to a project, whether there is substance to um, the, the particular idea, you do have to understand how it all works, how it all breaks down, um, how it all traces back, um, you know, to, to really understand the risks involved, to understand the counterparties, because there can be a lot of, you know, marketing speak, which actually clouds the substance in something. And if you are a um, if you are a, a business person in this space, if, if you are someone who's investing in this space, it becomes even more important to understand the tech. And it's not a matter of making something simpler because uh, sometimes um, it's a matter of understanding a lot about this space and then making it simple. But also what I find from talking to a lot of clients, but it's also that sometimes it's not what they ask you for the questions of what they ask of their lawyers, but often once you hear about their business model and you hear about their objectives and you hear about what they want to do, it's only then that I, um, I, I, I let them know perhaps this is what you actually want to ask me. Perhaps this is what you're getting to and this is what I can offer and in, in where I can help you and how I can help you strategize for your business and what you need for your legal services. So you need to understand the tech in this space, but you also need to hear beyond the questions and, and understand the business and the client beyond 
beyond what they're telling you. And, and I think that is actually one of the um, most interesting parts about you know, this space. Yeah, going behind the tech basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, reading between the lines. Yes. Please. Yeah. So I think I actually touched upon, um, you know, some similar themes when I spoke as well. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of about um, having the confidence to dive in, um, ask the questions, even if one doesn't understand, and you know, learning from one's clients. There's there's um, it's absolutely okay. But I actually wanted to make a, a somewhat macro point, you know, because I've been in the traditional financial services space as well, servicing financial institutions, banks, funds. Um, and I, I would argue that the language there is equally uh, geeky and nerdish in its own sort of way. So I think, um, you know, it, it's not just a tech industry. I think just in any sort of specialist industry it tends to sort of just become a little bit clubby. And I think the more and more domain expertise you acquire, you just kind of tend to go into a little sort of uh, hallowed circles. I would actually say that um, I've, and again, this is just sort of a contrast. I found that the tech industry, particularly the, the FinTech blockchain crypto industry um, that's serviced out of Singapore to be actually more egalitarian in its approach than the traditional finance industry that I've been used to. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's all a little bit relative, but I think, you know, I, I think you do make a, a serious uh, point and I do think um, it kind of has to do with, uh, with again, a, a macro point, which is that I think it's also just about all of us becoming more comfortable with, um, uh, you know, more multi-dimensional understanding of issues. And I think that's really something that we should be taught in schools and universities. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I think because if we don't kind of understand it, then again, as women, actually, that becomes more of a disadvantage for us because we don't feel confident enough to ask the same question. So the man might not understand either, but he doesn't feel underconfident by asking questions to understand more, whereas we do. So that kind of, um, I think some of it is just that confidence issue that I talked about earlier, but it's also about, uh, you know, our worlds in general just becoming a lot more fluid. You know, there's just no longer can anybody just sit and look at an issue just from a business perspective or an accounting perspective or a compliance perspective or a legal perspective? I think we all have to, you know, kind of venture out of our uh, domain expertise. And I think that'll just make, you know, everything just less big and scary as well. Yeah, maybe I can add to that. Uh, so within, within uh, my, my um, company, uh, which is TZ APAC, we work on an open source blockchain technology platform called Tezos. So that's one of the beautiful things about um, what Pooja mentioned about egalitarianism within the blockchain space. Um, we open source a lot of code. So, and Ethereum as well, they do it too. And there are developer communities that are actively building on these open source platforms. And so, knowledge is freely shareable. Anyone can just go to like Stack Exchange or Discord and then have conversations about their code, go to GitHub, look at the code repo um, and actually just learn off YouTube. You can be a self-taught programmer, like you, how you can be a self-taught makeup artist if you watch beauty guru YouTube videos. So uh, yeah, it, it's a, uh, and I also agree that universities, um, need to really catch up because uh, online education, especially when it was, uh, you know, accelerated by the pandemic, really uh, is giving these institutional institutions a run for their money. Um, a lot of courses are moving online. Uh, you know, you can literally just get a marketing, everything I learned in university can co be considered obsolete. Like uh, it's, it's literally, um, uh, tech companies like Google, Facebook are literally pushing out new updates all the time to their platform. So you got to keep going to the documentation on their website anyway to refresh your knowledge. So um, yeah, it's the same with blockchain platforms as well. So uh, I feel that um, in terms of mainstream adoption, um, when it comes to building products, we need the builders, the visionaries who will come up with interesting product ideas, like, okay, smart wallets or, um, that enable you to transact at like maybe like less, like zero cost. For now you do have 
solutions like this, but uh, they are operating like GrabPay, for example, it operates under the existing banking infra rails though. So there is a lot of hidden costs underlying their operations. So when you strip them away and you re-architect like the entire financial system, you're going to get a very, very interesting, um, yeah, you're going to get very interesting use cases of finance evolving uh, between communities globally, as opposed to centralized entities across the world. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating space and, and you know, it would be interesting to see more real life applications like e-commerce or like uh, more um, larger tech companies like maybe Microsoft or IBM just building more and more uh, like easy to use solutions on the blockchain to really make it mainstream because customers don't really know, need to know what's going on underneath the hood most of the time. They just need to know that, oh, okay, yeah, this, block, this technology enhances my day-to-day -day life and enhances my productivity. Yeah, I think that's that's what they need to know. And the best way to do it is just tell the story, like humanize the technology. So you have people like us <laughs> talking about it in the panels. You can put a face to to the industry and, um, you know, hopefully that's one step forward in demystifying this space with one conversation at a time. Yeah, totally agree. It's a up and coming industry and you know it's very interesting. Yeah, humanize the technology. Somebody Max it, thanks Catherine. I would like to know more about blockchain after hearing you speak. <laughs> I, 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 I echo that. I think when I mm. first met Catherine um in the course of access, I always feel that she's able to put out um, you know, simplify concepts in a way that I, I sometimes really can't, you know, even after thinking about it. So Kentrin has that <laughs> amazing gift in this space, yes. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Grace, you're too kind. <laughs> yes. Oh, and he had a nice small helps. <laughs> 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 okay, that was very interesting. Um, okay, so... Maybe we'll have one last question um, to the entire panel. Uh, what would you recommend to other women who aspire to be in this blockchain space? Anyone? Grace? Catherine? Okay. Okay, if no one's starting, I'll start first then. Um, yeah. So, um, um, I would say to be your own um, authentic selves because I think... Um, a lot of um, females sometimes feel they have to be a certain personality or a certain caricature in this space or to be someone different. But I think the more you allow yourself to freely experiment what you can do and have some interesting detours, even in your career and career path and what you do, and you have the courage to reinvent yourself, especially in the fintech space, I think that's quite uh, important. Um, because, um, you know, one in life needs a little madness and, you know, basically if you don't become the ocean, you'll be seasick every day. So I, I think that is um, my thoughts about living in life and also, you know, being uh, in the fintech space. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll go next. Mm. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I think um, the most important two words I got from my leadership coaching uh, from Subin, um, just to trust yourself. Yeah, like as Grace mentioned, every, every one of us has a voice. Every one of us has a unique story to tell. There's only one Oriana, one Megan Lee, one Pooja, one Grace. So, you know, we're all like, what's that? What is that um, song that said we're, we're all stardust? Okay, I can't remember, but- um, all stardust. Yeah, it's it's something like we're all magical beings. Like we're all literally like you all you, you all are unicorns, you know. One in a million. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think that we should definitely celebrate that. Um, celebrate all the small little wins you have every day, and and then never stop dreaming. Because um, I think um, the blockchain space is is some can sometimes seem a bit intimidating, but. I think if you really want to do something and you just set an intention and put it out there in the universe, you, you yeah, by hook or by crook, like you do once you take one step at a time, you're definitely going to get to your destination. 
I mean, it's, it's also like embodying a certain kind of like state of being where you are operating from this state of abundance. Sorry, I'm getting a bit psychological here, but like, uh, yeah, it's it's about manifesting that intention and um, doing it with purpose and clarity and confidence. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, so I'm gonna like end my spiel with a Nelson Mandela story. He got stuck in prison for 27 years. So like literally within the first 10 years, he's like, oh man, I'm gonna get out of here. And I hate all my prison guards. They're like torturing me and like demeaning my humanity. And then in the next 17 years, he's like, actually, I think I can get out of here. I think I think I'm gonna start writing letters. So he starts writing letters to the United States government. Three years on, they read his letters and they're like, yeah, I think this guy has something meaningful to say. And he's talk campaigning against apartheid. And then in the end, he finally gets released after a lot of external lobbying and he becomes, and then Nelson Mandela was like, yeah, you know what? I think someone can lead this nation. I can, I can, I think, I think so. I can <laughs> do this, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, and oh yes, Asasuki as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, sure. it's okay. yeah, so it all begins here. The space of the universe is between both our ears. Imagine <laughs> <laughs> the stage she is right now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she shouldn't yeah. have. Uh, yeah, she made some moves that were not so popular. Yeah. Yeah, actually, okay. um, yeah. Catherine's uh, yeah. just, uh, you know, kind of raised an interesting point, which is, which is what I'd wanted to highlight as well, which is about... Uh, you know, mind space. Um, I think my uh, takeaway for anyone, actually for men, women, anybody is just about really fiercely guarding your mind space. I think uh, it's been a challenging year, I think in different shapes and forms for most of us. I think those of us uh, who are in Singapore are quite privileged, but I think we're all getting a little bit antsy uh, being stuck on this rather small island now. Uh, and, you know, no matter what kind of work you do, but I think particularly as you become more senior and you have to really kind of make difficult judgment calls, particularly if you're running on practice and you have to do the hustle, I think you really need to have your head in the game. Uh, and, you know, for, for different people, there are different things that work. Is it running? Is it yoga? Is it Netflix? Who knows? Who cares, actually? But it's just important to kind of, you know, get off the treadmill, be it a blockchain treadmill or another treadmill, and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, repower uh, that engine so you can sort of be firing on all cylinders. Yeah, actually for this point, I also, I totally agree with you guys that uh, the confidence and everything, but also from my own experience, right, uh, to do a startup, to do the business. So another thing I think very important is to, how, how, how to deal with the failures. It's very important and because I say uh, the, the, the last, the past five years, right, of my, my personal journey as an entrepreneur to start a small company, to do business, to try to survive. Actually, in along this journey, we have a few times to fail. So we try out many things, it doesn't work. Actually, the first project, which I mentioned is a smart travel solution. It's a mobile app, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work out. Because it's it's super hard to get get users for the app, right? And we don't ha we didn't have a, 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 a we didn't have a, a way to generate profits. Meaning we, we, we did have the, the, the investment from the investors, but that's not sustainable. Okay, a startup can never survive by having the funds from the investors. You must have the capability to to survive to to grow by yourself. So. That was, uh, that was uh, it's like for the past few years, right? We have uh, a few failures and, uh, but the thing is, one thing we learn is how to deal with the failures, right? It's like, as long as you are not die, you always have the chance to, to, to be up again, right? Especially, this is something that uh, I love the blockchain industry because this is quite new industry, always have new opportunities for people to go, right? Either it's in the regulation, legal, or in the e-commerce, the big corporate, or the, the public chain, whatever, it's all opportunities. So it's very important, or I, I guess you have the higher chance 
to be successful in the blockchain industry if you continue to explore comparing in some other industries this is super new right there's a for a lot of uh, aspects there's new authorities right if you you can be you can be in this industry in this part uh, fast enough you can be the authorities right so especially as a as, as a ladies the women i think also need to be uh, don't think yourself as a lady or, or a woman okay just uh, as a players in the market so sometimes i from point of view is uh, the market is fair enough to either the man or woman so just uh, do what you can and uh, to continue to explore even though it's fa you fail it doesn't matter just do do try to uh, i go this way right it can go to the end just try to try some other ways you can ultimately you can get to where you you want yeah so this is uh, this is my own experience and uh, this is really really what i want to share to the other audience attendees today uh, especially the young people who want to uh, enter into this industry or the people who have some ideas say uh, i want to do this but i don't know how go out to try to talk to people it's just, let's say our panelists, right? Everyone is so friendly. It's so kind to, to we want to share. We want to share what we, 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 we experience. We want to, we, we are willing to, you know, uh, help you to connect to the resource, to the right people to talk with, right? So just as Grace mentioned, she also has a mentor in blockchain industry, right? So I also have a, a friend, actually it's a friend. She's a, she was Belinda and she, she was very active in the blockchain industry. So. She is a, she was very, you know, generous to share very little small things. I remember in the beginning, she told me how to use the crypto wallet, uh, how to do the trading. It's very small things, but that can make big impact. Yeah. So, so willing to share and uh, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Reading some of the chats and Sharon said we always hear men's slogans. He's a good guy to work with. <laughs> Never once have I heard she's a good girl. Yeah, we should advocate more of that. No, she's a good girl to work with. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, yeah, and and I I would echo that you know it really has to be supported in the industry. I think when I first started out as um a lot in this space, there were times where um, I've had actually one male client who actually expressly said he did not want to work with a senior female lawyer. He would rather have a male lawyer on his case. Um, <laughs> um, but at the same time, I have had clients um, who, um, you know, male notwithstanding, uh, you know, we, we, we developed very strong relationships and, you know, they strongly supported me and my team. And, you know, I, I do not really see this as, as a gender issue. And I think um, it, it's really not one. And, and it you, you're really working with different specialists in this space who bring different things to the table. Um, I do see, I do see that in the legal space, sometimes, you know, a lot of female lawyers get talked over. That's the issue of mansplaining a lot. Um, and, and finding your voice is sometimes difficult, especially for starting a lot of starting female lawyers in this space. Um, it took me some time to also find mine. I used to be extremely soft-spoken for those people who know me. Uh, so, um, but definitely we, we should support other people in this space. And I'm really thankful for those who, you know, do encourage or probe me up or push me forward or recommend me to other clients. And it's really, really nice because I think this community does have a lot of people who are uh, indeed very um, kind-hearted and, you know, share a lot of their knowledge and expertise in this space. Yeah. I can't imagine you being soft-spoken. <laughs> you're very polite but uh yeah like i mean you're you i i'm seeing the version 2.0 now i guess like you're you're very like go getter and you're very proactive and you're always offering your opinions to the board very good opinions uh, yeah version 2.0 indeed uh, when i first started in mes version 1.0 yes <laughs> yeah you uh, want to messages at like midnight <laughs> okay, sorry yes go ahead 
No, no, I mean, uh, Ida said that Grace is to Grace. Uh, she was running a company as a CEO with six men supposedly reporting to her, but she still gets men's plane to. Yeah. But she's where she is because other women supported and championed and fought for her. So nice. Women supporting women. Max said I came on tonight because Grace was speaking. <laughs> oh. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks for joining. <laughs> but now you have everyone here that you can follow. Yes, very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually came on tonight because Catherine told me about this event. So it's the mm. same thing. We, we, we share it around. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yeah, actually, this is what women in blockchain is. Like supporting one another, you know, women supporting women, especially in this blockchain space, you know. We could gather everybody together for support and networking and just cheering each other on. Yeah. Okay. So um I think we should wrap up. We can wrap up the panel now. So uh thank you all for coming to attend this panel. Happy International Women's Day. And to the guys, same, thank you for coming. Uh yeah. So maybe the panel would like to say some some words to the uh, yeah say bye <laughs> bye bye okay. thanks very thank much you, Oriana. thanks, thanks ladies thank you everybody thank, thank you, you everyone for coming all right happy ida booty bye